Hello, my name is Lynn Hilton Wilson, and I'm here to talk to you about the, some of the hard questions in church history. And one of those that comes in conjunction with sections 103 and 105 is the whole issue of Zion's camp. It's one of my favorite parts of, of church history, especially in Missouri history. And the lessons that I can take away from this experience are wonderful. I also feel like it has some of the harder questions. Not only are there questions about why the Lord had them go if they weren't even able to fight. Some people even called it a failure. What went wrong? Why didn't it carry through is the way they were told that it would? And why didn't God protect them from the outbreak of cholera that afflicted the camp after it was right before it was disbanded and afterwards? Why were women and children on this camp? That was a military march. And what is this Zelf Bones business? And many of you probably already know a lot about Zelf's Bones, and I hope to share the latest research that's been made available to us through Book of Mormon Central and through Joseph Smith Papers Project on the Zelf Bones issues that has um, erupted in a whole new um, realm of contention amongst believers in the Book of Mormon. So let's talk about the timeline, first of all, just to get ourselves going. Starting on July 20th, 1831, is the date that Joseph dedicated the land of Missouri. And we've talked about this when he dedicated Jackson County as a place of Zion in past lessons. Then two years later, on January 20th, 1833, is when the Missouri locals had their secret constitution and this meeting where they invited the Mormons to come and said, you've got to leave. Um, in fact, we're going to start upping our violence. And as you remember, the saints were already having um, their crops burned, um, lots of violence on minor skirmishes. But starting on July 20th, major things happened, you know, that taking the roofs off. We talked a lot about this with section 57, 58, 59, that, that time period. But it slowed down three days later when Bishop Partridge said, okay, we'll leave. We'll leave between January and April of 1834. And it was during that period of time that they began preparing to leave, but the violence never completely stopped. It was just down to a dull roar. And when the saints received direction from Joseph to go through the legal courts, they applied to Governor Dunklin. And Governor Dunklin said, I, we will come and help you. And it's at that point when Governor Dunklin said, we'll help you, that the saints said, actually, we're going to stay. And we're going to um, try to work through the legal means. And violence uproared again. And in November, we had horrendous situations where they were, um, again, homes burned and people chased out. And actually, it was through most of October as well. But that first week in November is when the saints actually were chased out. And then they waited in the line up north between the county of Jackson and um, I'll get you a map in just a minute, but between Jackson and Clay County, there's a, uh, the Missouri River comes in there, and they wait in line, and they were able to ferry across. Word got to Joseph a couple of different times about how the refugees were doing, and um, in the dead of winter, Parley P. Pratt and Lyman White took the messages, this is 1834 now, took the message up to Joseph, and they arrived on a Friday on February 22nd to tell Joseph the latest of what had been happening and the atrocities and the violence. And Joseph um, pled with the Lord for help. And that um, two days later, on a Sunday morning, Joseph received section 103 that called for this um, group of people between 100 and 500 uh, men to protect the saints and a military group to go down and reclaim their lands is how they interpreted it, the um, revelation. But if you go back and read it from the eyes of the Lord, um, he asks them to forgive uh, four times before they will ever uh, attack. And he also at tells them that there are stipulations upon which Zion will be redeemed. Between that May 24th, where he, at the church meeting, calls for the saints um, to gather and help this group uh, to form up this camp of Israel or Zion's camp, and the 5th of May, we're gathering, gathering, gathering. He sends out, you know, at least um, 10 different men to recruit for this Zion's camp. And that is all happening during these two or three months in the early spring of 1834. And once those men have enough people to go, they begin heading on this 900 mile journey south. And on June 19th, there are gathered, coming from all the different recruiters, bringing their people in, up to about 207 men, 11 women, and 7 children. 
and that is the largest the group ever got. So the Lord asked for between 100 and 500, and we, and we got 207. It reminds me of the great Old Testament story of Gideon um, and his numbers, and the Lord cutting them back, and the Lord growing in other times. There's lots of examples in the Old Testament that fit into this Zion's camp, and there's a lot of parallels we see there. The Lord even called Joseph, uh, raising up one like unto Moses in this situation. By June 22nd, though, Joseph received section 105, and the Lord said, you're done. There's a detour here. I asked you to go down in this way, and you did not. So we're, um, you have dropped your part of the bargain. That means it will not happen. And the Lord accepts those saints who made the big sacrifices, but they will not fight now. The people were not ready to form a Zion society. On July 3rd, Zion's camp is um, formally disbanded and as a military unit, and many of the saints return to Kirtland. Others stay down in Missouri and with the refugee saints there in Clay County and other surrounding counties, but not Jackson County. <laughs> and we also have this um, a few other things that happen after here. That there's a cholera outbreak and um, some really tragic things, and I've got more details in the handout under the timetable, and you'll find the handout at the same page that you link on, click on for the video, there's a small little tab to click on for the handout. And there's a lot more information in the handout than I'll have time to share with you now. I just want to keep straight two governors in Missouri. The first one, who served from 1832 to 1836, was Governor Daniel Dunklin. So he is involved in, with the um, atrocities in Jackson County. But when the, Governor Dunklin is um, finished with his service, Governor Lillian Boggs steps up in 36 to 40. And Governor Boggs had actually lived in Jackson County, Missouri, and he had been a part of the um, people who were trying to raise money for the Santa Fe Trail and um, the Get Rich Quick. And he, he was very offended also by the intrusion of these religious um, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and all that they stood for and the taking over the land, you know, by, by 1833, there were 33 percent of the population of Jackson County were members of our faith, and it was growing, and that had happened in a two-year period, and so they were very concerned what was going to happen to the political balance of not only the um, city, but the county, and then the county seat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, both Brother Dunklin and Brother Boggs um, I shouldn't call them brother, I should call them governors, excuse me, had a um, request from Joseph to help. And the um, and Bishop Partridge and um, Sidney and, you know, many different requests for help, help, help. And both of them promised help and both of them did not fulfill those promises. I want you to get this map just of this little area here. And you can see how the river sections off Jackson County from Clay County and Ray County. Now, some of the saints, as they were being chased out in the end of 1833, just went due um, east into Lafayette County, but very few. Most of them went north into Clay County. They found refuge there. And as we mentioned before when we talked about Missouri, um, there's a whole different group of people living in Jackson County. They're the roughest of the ruffians. And, you know, they were there for a very specific reason, and um, the— People that were in Clay County and Ray County had different feelings, and they actually welcomed um, many of the members of the church in and provided places for them on their property or opened up lands for them, not expecting them to stay long, but at least for short term, they were allowed to come in as religious refugees. And I might add also political refugees. There was a lot of issues politically that they differed on that was significant in their uh, relationships. I wanted to show you the kind of boats that they were using to cross that river as they waited in that line on November 6th and 7th in 1833. This is the kind of the boat that the saints could have been going on. They also had other barges, but it says there was a long line in some of the journal accounts, a long line waiting to board um, these steamers. And you see all sorts of pictures with these different steamers on there. My question, as I'm sure it was your questions, it, why didn't the Lord allow these people to protect their property? You know, when we think of the Book of Mormon with Captain Moroni and the title of liberty, that we are waived to um, protect our women and children and our lands and our rights and our properties, this doesn't seem to be applicable here. For some reason, they were not allowed to fight back. The Lord told them, 
repeatedly, I want you to be a people of peace. Work on yourselves. Don't worry about your neighbors. If you were being good, it wouldn't be such a problem. Um, and most of the people there were being good. They were obeying the commandments. They were trying to live the law of consecration. They were doing their best in the situation, but not everyone was. And Zion has to be a unified effort. The real thing, though, I think more difficult than the physical challenges was that spiritual message that why did the Lord tell them to come and establish Zion? Why did Joseph dedicate this land as Zion? Why in their minds is this all for the second coming of our Savior? We are trying to prepare our people to be ready to receive the bridegroom at his coming, and he, he doesn't even protect us? You know, it, it, spiritually, this is they felt victimized. They felt like they were in a very estranged position. Why has, hast thou forsaken us? And of course, those words are taken from our Savior on the cross, and some of the saints felt that way. But as sections 103 and 105 tell us, there were reasons why the Lord had to chasten them. They were not prepared, and when they were left to their own, they were not um, improving. And so the Lord had to add adversity and opposition in all things for them to realize that they needed to move forward. I just wanted to include some of the verses to let you see These here in section 98, there are 10 times where the Lord tells them to proclaim peace and not fight back. The message of forgiveness is amazing. Do you remember President Hinckley years ago said, the greatest virtue on earth is forgiveness. And Jesus Christ is trying to teach these early saints that principle. Over and over again in section 98, if a nation should proclaim war, um, first lift a standard of peace. And then he goes on and on. Thou shalt forgive them until 70 times 7. If they are repenting, you have to forgive them. If they don't repent first time, you still forgive them. If they don't repent the second time, you still forgive them. This is verse 42 and 43. But if they um, trespass you against thee the third time and repent not, you have to forgive them. The fourth time, I will allow you to go back. And these are difficult situations when you are talking about a whole community. But in our own lives, these are very applicable. And if, and if a person in our family or friends or circle claims to repent, then we are to forgive them 70 times 7. Now, of course, there's a difference between condoning the sin and forgiving the person. And this is very complicated, and it's um, in the Missouri era right here. And were they actually repenting? No, they were not. You know, why can't we fight back? And the Lord says, I want to teach you to be a peace people. I want you to proclaim peace and learn to get along with other people. And there were things that they said and did. You know, most of the saints really were, I think, trying to live the gospel, as we talked about in section 59. But the idea that they would say to their neighbors, we're taking over this whole land. We are to build a Zion society. God has given us this land. It's not for you. You know, those kind of things were were pretty offensive. And um, the Lord had to teach them what it meant to be a people of peace. I mentioned earlier in the timeline that Parley P. and Lyman White made that long, long journey in the snow, in the frozen, with um, cold, up to Kirtland to talk to Joseph face to face. They wanted to really explain the plight of the refugees and what had happened. And Joseph had been yearning to receive a revelation, and their Friday visit stimulated a revelation by Sunday morning. And the Lord told Joseph and the saints, I will give unto you a revelation and a commandment that you may know how to act in the discharge of your duties concerning the salvation and redemption of your brethren who have been scattered out of the land of Zion. I have suffered them thus far that those who call themselves after the name might be chastened for a little season for a sore and grievous chastisement because they did not hearken altogether unto the precepts and commandments which I gave unto them. To me, it's like a sports team. It doesn't matter if Eight of the members of the team are doing their best. If there's two that are not, I'm afraid that um, those two could bow it and you could lose the game. The Lord has asked us to become a unified people and to prepare to meet the Savior in a way where we are all working together. And that may seem unfair to you, but that's our responsibility. And I see that in in my relationships in, in work, in family, in community. We have got to learn how to work things out mutually and how to lift each other and how to have charity. And I love the fact that the last beatitude is 
blessed are those that persecute you and um, that you need to pray for them and you need to lift them and learn to love even when you are despised. And the Lord needed to teach the saints that. And he um, goes on in section 103 to then say, it's been the fourth time. Let's gather a host together. He says, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. I don't know if you remember um, my class on section 84, where we talked about the power of God is the priesthood. And he is asking them to gather together under the direction of the priesthood, meaning we are patient, long-suffering, gentle, meek, kind, and then we will have the power of God to bless us. We're not talking about um, a priesthood organization. We are talking about the power of God will redeem these people. And he calls for the hundred, you know, he gets 207 right by the end. And I think that's because some of the saints that were scattered across Missouri joined there at the end. And um, we bump it up seven more people. But the Lord warns them, Zion will not be redeemed with muskets, you know, with pistols. Zion is not going to be redeemed that way. It is going to be redeemed through God's power. Um, he calls them in this revelation to gather their supplies and their money. And we have some wonderful stories about John and Elsa Johnson. Do you remember theirs was the farm just 30 miles south of Kirtland where Joseph and Emma lived for a year and they had the twins, uh, the adopted Murdoch, Murdoch twins there. And um, beautiful stories about the building forth of the finishing of the Joseph Smith translation and starting the, organiz starting the um, compilation for publication of the Book of Commandments. That's all in John and John, um, Elsa Johnson's farm. And they donate um, much of their surplus and other, and even the farms that they were needing to supply money for this. And there's a wonderful story about Joseph and, and saying, we have got to have money to do this. And he's been trying to get money from the Kirtland Saints. And of course, they're in great poverty and um, it's requiring such a leap of faith. Remember, tithing and request of money is never about money. It's always about a leap of faith. It's always about taking the Lord at his word. And Joseph felt inspired to say one day, I need money for Zion's camp or for the camp of Israel, he called it, and I will have it tomorrow. And a letter arrived the next day from Boston and a dear saint named Ruth Voice, Sister um, Ruth Voice, um, had written a check and included it, the funds that were needed in that letter for Joseph. And um, Wilfred Woodruff says it was $250. So that's nearly a year's worth of wages for a working man, a, a laborer, a day laborer. But um, other people say, no, it couldn't have been that much money. It must have been closer to 150. And, and memories are different. And I appreciate that the stories sometimes get changed through years and you remember things differently. But the bottom line is an enormous amount of money arrived, which then was able to um, allow Joseph to leave with his group. And his first group is just 82. And they're meeting with, up in different places with these other. I mentioned that there were these um, other people who were sent out to recruit. Hiram went up to Michigan with Lyman White and they all come down with their groups. And in my handout, I have where you can read more about each of these different groups and who was with them. But they begin in early May and they meet up together at some points on May 5th, actually, is the date that um, Joseph leaves and Hiram leaves his location. They both come together, but some groups are leaving a little bit earlier and they begin this Zion's March, this camp across the 900 miles of the Midwest in the heat of the summer, in the fatigue of the um, challenges, getting clean water. It, was bloody feet and blisters were mentioned regularly. But the Lord was clear in section 103 that this was a source of relief. And they're bringing supplies for the refugee saints as much as it is a military march. Now they did march and they were, and most of the people there, including Joseph, thought that there would be battles. And um, the Lord had a different thought. And I just see myself so many times in my life when I think I'm going straight ahead the Lord gives me a detour. And in the case of Zion's camp, that detour was actually a U-turn at the end. During this time, um, there was a, a not a harmonious feeling in the camp. As the different groups came together and as illness and struggles and heat and fatigue and dehydration afflicted them, um, there was a lot of, of hard feelings. I'm sure many of the people there tried very hard to stay positive and and have a good attitude, but it was difficult. George A. is Joseph's little cousin, and George A. Smith recorded in his journal, the prophet Joseph took a full share of the fatigue of the entire journey. He walked most of the time, and he had a full proportion of blistered, bloody, and sore feet. 
But most of the men in the camp complained to Joseph of sore toes and blistered feet, long drives, scanty supplies of provisions, poor qualities of bread, bad corn dodgers, frosty butter, strong honey, and maggoty bacon and cheese. I mean, doesn't that just sound revolting? Oh! Even a dog could not bark as some men without their murmurings at Joseph. Well, the problem is, you may remember this story, um, the problem is it was Joseph's dog. And one of the groups came in very late to, into the camp. Remember, they're all divided in sections of 10s and 20s and 50s as a military march was. And one group came in late and, and good old um, Major, Major is Joseph's dog that was even with him in Liberty Jail, um, Major is just going crazy, barking his head off to try to protect the saints. And of course, they are fellow saints and they get very mad and the guy threatens to kill the dog and Joseph gets mad saying, don't you dare kill my dog. And the guy yells, if you bite me, I'll kill you. And, you know, they get in a little tizzy there. And, and Joseph, um, you can see here on this map, the, the, the trail that they went. Um, but on June 3rd, Joseph warned them that in consequence of their misconduct, a scourge would strike the camp. And unfortunately, that prophecy came to pass. Um, it reminds me of, sometimes he says, watch out, watch out, or else, okay, it's too late, it's going to happen. That's exactly what we saw in Abinadi. At first he said, watch out, watch out, and then Abinadi says, nope, it's going to happen. You're going to be under bondage. And so even though Alma the elder was able to have a group of saints that believed, they still had to be in bondage because they had already passed that point where the prophet declared a scourge would come. And that's exactly what we see here. It reminds me also when we talk about the cholera of the mosaic, things that happened during those 40 years in the wilderness, like the snakes and things like that, that happened to that camp. But on June 4th, the camp enters Missouri. And they've tried to be nonchalant. They're a smaller group initially, but by the time they're crossing the camp, they, the border here, they've, they've got a big number here. It's between 200 and 207. We don't know exactly when the last seven join in, but these 11 women and seven children and 200 men are, are fully armed and they are marching and people are noticing. And the people in Jackson County hear that they're coming and they start burning their homes and everything that was left. We don't talk much about these 11 women. We aren't exactly sure because some of the lists of the women are different. But I wrote down um, the ones that I knew of that are recorded. We've got some great literature on them. If you want to look at my handout or at Book of Mormon Central or Joseph Smith Papers Project, uh, BYU Studies also has articles on them. And these women came because they wanted to relocate to Missouri. They wanted to be part of the group to build Zion. They were converts from all over the eastern United States, and they wanted to be established in Zion. And Nancy Holbrook and her sister-in-law, Eunice Holbrook, were two of those who wanted to, and they brought their three young children with them on this journey. And they said, we will come and we will be, um, we'll help with all the laundry, we'll help with, I, I just feel like the women's work, the men when they got to the camp had to build the fires, but the women had to do s such a Herculean job at that end. It's just amazing. But they grew in their faith and their strength. I love reading the accounts of some of these women. One of them did not make it back. Betsy Parrish um, passed away, but the, all the others were able to be established in Missouri. This was really interesting. The women had marched all the way down to Missouri. They've crossed the river. They're into Missouri, and they caught the Mississippi River. They're into Missouri, and Joseph says, okay, men, let's build some houses for the women here because we might have battles now. And Nancy Holbrook and others um, came to Joseph and said, we'd, we'd like you to reconsider that. And Nancy wrote in her journal that Joseph said to her in reply, this is the prophet's words, if the sisters were willing to undergo a siege with the camp, they could come along with. Truly, it would be a revolutionary notion for sisters to accompany the men into a possible military skirmish. The women said they would like to go and they liked brother Joseph even better before this privilege that he gave them of continuing in the camp. So the women felt validated. They felt part of the team. And I mentioned before that I think Joseph was the first feminist in America um, to the degree that we see here and allowing the women to join in. If they want to come, then you come. We can use you. And um, hopefully the children were, would be protected um, but this is really an amazing conversation that we have from some of their journals. This one's from Nancy. They had a little skirmish. They call it a rendezvous in the lecture. I wish I'd know a little bit more about what that meant. But um, on June 8th, they were camped at the Salt River in Missouri. That's just over the Mississippi a, a, a day or two. You know, they haven't crossed much. 
And Lyman White was a veteran of the War of 1812, and Joseph assigns him, or there, he, actually, he's voted in to be their governor, and they uh, they also vote in and make other people leaders in the different military organizations so that they are prepared in case there is a time of battle so that things can go down in the order in preciseness as they move on. Now, word came to the Jackson County people that the saints were coming, and then word got back to the um, Israel's camp, Camp of Israel or Zion's camp, that they were burning everything left that was the property of the churches in Jackson County, they, they burned. And that was very discouraging. So Joseph does not go into Jackson County. He takes the group to Clay County. That's where the majority of the refugees are. And they camp on um, very close to a real little river called Fishing River. And it's um, a beautiful summer, um, hot, humid. And um, the camp, um, is, as I said, sort of frustrated at Joseph most of the time, uh, at least some of them were, and they are debating what to do, and Joseph is saying the Lord has told us not to go in, and that he will fight our battles, and that night is when that horrific snowstorm, I mean, hailstorm came, came. The Missourians came up to meet them, and there's over 300 of them. We don't know the exact number because they never had a battle, but uh, they were outnumbered, um, and there's on one side of the um, bank with the Missourians, and then on the other side of the bank with the members of the Zion's camp. And a horrific storm comes out, a hail storm comes. The river gr- rose 30 feet, they were told, and most of the people, as the storm is blowing over their tents uh, on the Saints' side, run and get coverage in a little abandoned church that was nearby. And Joseph comes in and says, um, God is in this storm. And as the storm rose and the Missourians um, were not able to cross the river, uh, they were trying to flee and save their lives from the flood. Um, They left and they never bothered the saints. And the next day when the saints came out, they found their tents and things all blown around. But they were able to gather up most of their supplies and nothing was lost that couldn't be repaired and things like that. I don't know what they did with their animals. I hope their animals were okay. Um, But as they stayed there on that fishing river is when Joseph said, what should we do and receive section 105? And this is one of the most beautiful and challenging sections. Um, When the Lord tells us to go one direction and then gives us a detour in our lives, it is very difficult to say, wait a minute, I trusted you when you said go this way. But I am one who has learned in my life that so many times my interpretations of the Lord's revelations are not necessarily what he is asking for. He probably always had in mind the detour, and he wanted to see if, like Abraham, we were willing to make this detour in what we thought was going to be our future. And during this time that they're on the fishing river, and Joseph receives this beautiful revelation, the Lord tells them, Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. Oh, what a slap in the face. You know, I I can't use you. You've made this long sacrifice. You think you have gone through Hades to get here. And yet I can't use you because you didn't do the thing that was most important to me. And that was be a people of God. Be a people filled with hope and charity and compassion and support your prophet. He stands in the place of Moses. He's my man. I'm speaking through him. He continues on. And my people must needs be chastened until they learn obedience. If it must be by the things which they suffer. This message is repeated from the book of Hebrews. We are perfected in the things that we suffer. And so this is why Elder Maxwell taught us Instead of asking, why are you doing this to me? We need to say, what can I learn? Or what more would you have me do? Or how can I improve? Um, I love the image that um, is well known now of Joseph's statement, I am a rough stone rolling. And as I roll down the hill, edges are knocked off. And I hope all of us can be molded like clay, like a potter that God will be able to mold us like clay. And if we don't have the soft enough heart to be molded by the Lord's hands, we will have to have um, the problem of, of 
being a rough stone rolling down the hill, giving bits of our hard edges rubbed off or knocked off as they were in this situation. In addition to those 10 times where the Lord told them to proclaim peace and to not go to war, here in section 105, he mentions again, I would like you to go to use judgment and justice according to the law. I would rather that you not fight. I would rather that you use what we have prepared in the Constitution and in the state law. I want you to sue for peace. I want you to make proposals for peace. And so even again on this fourth time, the saints are asked to forgive them and to work within the system rather than fighting. God is not a man of war unless he commands it. And more often than not, especially in this time, the Lord did not command it. Shortly thereafter, I think it was within a day or two, 63, 68, I think 68 members of the camp broke out with cholera. As you recall, cholera comes from drinking dirty water. It's still a real problem in Some parts of our world in India and sections of Africa deal with this regularly. It's a microorganism that grows, that that lives in dirty water. And you become extremely dehydrated. Um, Your body is expelling liquid um, in every way possible and you're nauseated, a lot of weight loss. And then, of course, with all that dehydration, it affects your blood pressure and it affects your um, heart rate and it can cause death. And that's exactly what happened. Um, of these 60 men, 68 men that were afflicted and one woman, 13 of them died. And the woman that died was Betsy Parrish. I wanted to also mention that Joseph himself had cholera. And the Lord felt the need to even have his prophet suffer with those who were suffering at that time. And Joseph himself learned and changed from this experience. This expulsion from Jackson County Um, is the first of three major expulsions across Missouri. They move up to Clay County, and the Clay people welcome them in with the understanding you are here just to get your emergency supplies before you go on. And after three years, they say, you've had long enough to get back on your feet. You need to be moving on. And uh, what we'll talk about in the future is what happens as they are removed from Clay County, and they then go to Caldwell County, and then they are removed from there. And of course, we know of the extermination order. So as we look at the history of Missouri, we have just begun the persecutions, but the saints felt they had no idea what lay in store for them. And Joseph felt inspired from the Lord to disband Zion's camp on that July 3rd. And I mentioned before, when we were doing the timeline, many went over and joined the rest of the refugees and stayed with them with their supplies that they had brought and to buoy them up and help prepare for the winter by building homes. And um, there in Clay County and others like Joseph went back up to Kirtland to be with his family and elsewhere. So was it a failure, Vaughn Brody? Was it a failure? As section 121 will teach Joseph in a few years, all these things will give the experience and be for thy good. And Joseph did not know at that time that the Lord was sifting the wheat from the chaff in this um, month of these men working together. And he was able to see who would be loyal to his prophet and who would serve and who are the hardest workers. And it's from this group of Zion's camp that we get nine of the apostles and the entire quorum of the 70 in just a matter of months after this experience. I feel like um, when I think the Lord is giving me a direction to go this direct, to go straight ahead, um, I, I better remain flexible because we always have challenges that arise. And what the Lord is trying to teach us is not what I thought the end goal was, but something else. And I feel that the, the, the straining out of this leadership is one of the major blessings of Zion's camp. Was it a failure? Absolutely not. We strengthened the saints in Missouri. It was a refuge for them. They felt that the prophet had come to help. Now, was it a failure as far as retaking the property in Jackson County? Yes, it was a total failure. But that was never the Lord's intent until the people were prepared, until they're ready. And that's this place of position where we stand right now as we look forward to the second coming of our Savior. The Lord has told us, I am waiting on you to be prepared. You may gain 
your Zion society, and then I can come. But we have to learn to live the law of consecration before the Lord can come again. These 12 apostles were initially called by order of age, and we'll talk more about them in a few weeks. In the last few minutes, I'd like to go back to a portion of Zion's camp that has become a hot topic in not only the subjects of history and geography, but also the subject of Joseph's prophetic call. And who was he? And this is used as an attack. So even though it's a small little incident that has a little bit of um, historical records about it that we can look into, um, it, it which really don't matter. And to me, it, it's just tiny. But the things that blew up after it are the reason why I'd like to discuss it. Most of you know who Zelf was. As Zion's camp is going across to Illinois, they come upon these burial mounds. And for some reason, the, the bones are not too far from the earth. You know, they see a top of a femur sticking up or something. And they found um, some bones and Joseph stops and talks about them and picks up one and, and a few people grab it and take it. And Brigham has it for a while and, and Wilfred Woodruff has it for a while. And Brother Burke finally is the one who carries it back up to Kirtland and, or has it in Kirtland for a while. And Nauvoo, when they are um, writing up the historical record and they measure them and they talk about them and they have them to check the DNA. So these bones have become sort of like a relic, in, uh, which always causes problems because the our memories of what happens in an event are affected by what we bring to that memory. You know, those people that had um, read the Book of Mormon and heard Joseph say, oh, these are bones, uh, we're, we're walking on, these are bones from a, a distant relative of a Lamanite. And they came to some conclusions because of where th their background was, oh, that means this was a Lamanite from the Book of Mormon period. And that is a problem that has... Um, plagued all of history, all of historical writing. Um, I love reading the apocryphal writings of the New Testament, and they say, oh, um, that means Jesus went all the way down the Nile River when he was in Egypt and went clear up to the pyramids. Well, no, that's not what it says at all. It says he had to leave the boundary to go into Egypt. That's only, that's only you know, less than 100 miles. That's just down to Masada, down to the end of the Dead Sea. Uh, the first body of the Dead Sea. You know, it's not that far. And so we do the same thing with history in all sorts of places. You know, our memories approach the subject and then identify it differently. And so it's good to go back. The only thing we have from Joseph is a letter that he wrote to Emma. And he didn't write it until June 4th. So we've got a few weeks in between here. He's not writing it the next day. Um, but we do have a record of someone who probably wrote it within a week. But Joseph is writing it within a few weeks because it happened in May and now it's in June. So less than a month. Joseph records to Emma, we were wandering over the plains of the Nephites recounting occasionally the history of the Book of Mormon, picking up their skulls and their bones of the proof that it's divine authenticity. Now, you can see right here in the letter where he says, his handwriting, actually this is probably rewritten into a book with a handwriting, but here you can see where he talks about the history of the Book of Mormon moving over the mounds that once beloved people of the Lord. He does not say Nephites. That is just part of one of the records. Well, why does one of the records say that? Let's go back and look at the others. We have four people that wrote about Zelf. Joseph doesn't name him, but four people say, Joseph picked up a, a skull and or a bone and said this belonged to Zelf. The first, the earliest one, Reuben McBride, doesn't say anything about him being a Nephite. In fact, um, it's not mentioned at all until way later, when people look back at it and say, oh yes, I think he was a Nephite. And so it was added into the record later. Um, and part of the problem is, from these four people that recorded it, over time, their memory changed and they added more information just like the story gets elaborated on. And I don't think it's intentional. You know, it's fascinating. As a, as a nurse, I love the study of memory. And it, as I um, record in my journal something and, and someone else records the same event, we're going to get two very different stories. And I feel the same way, not only about um, my own personal life, but I am very empathetic when looking at history. These people are carrying around a pen and a paper, and they are trying to use a quill, I mean, not a pen, and um, recording just little snidbits, and they don't get the whole story. 
But we have a great no why from Book of Mormon Central that I'd like you to hear on this. It's very short. It's fabulous. During the March of Zion's camp in 1834, several brethren remembered Joseph Smith identifying some bones as those of a Lamanite warrior named Zelf. Since then, confusion has arisen as to who exactly Zelf was. Early journal entries of those on Zion's camp contained conflicting details. The history of the church combined these conflicting journal accounts as if they were Joseph Smith's own words. But we now know that Joseph left behind no direct statements about Zelf. Recently, research into the pre-publication manuscript of the history of the church and other early sources has shed much light on who Zelf was. The pre-publication manuscript was written while Joseph was alive, and it has several key terms that are crossed out, specifically the words Nephites, Hill Cumorah, and Last Great Struggle were crossed out. From what we now know, Zelf was a white Lamanite who fought under a leader named Onondagus. Beyond that, what Joseph said is not entirely clear. Apostle John A. Witso speculated that Zelf probably dated from a later time when Nephites and Lamanites had been somewhat dispersed and had wandered over the country. Although this information doesn't help pinpoint such things as Book of Mormon geography or events, we can be thankful that we know some small details about the Lamanite warrior. And now you know why. As they recited in the Book of Mormon Central Know Why, I want to remind you to look right here. When Joseph is editing the text during his lifetime, when it says Nephite, he crosses it out. When he says Hill Cumora, he crosses it out. When it says the great last battle or the last great struggle, he crosses it out. It's not that it wasn't edited. The problem was these four accounts were combined into the church history. And by taking different people's ideas and trying to combine them, we have problems. We do the same thing in the New Testament when we take all four gospels and trying to recite them in harmony. They were not written in harmony. They're talking from very different perspectives and memories, and we're probably getting the story wrong when we add the details in harmony for Zelf, and sometimes even in the, New, in the Gospels in the New Testament. The um, archaeologists have gone into Illinois and looked at this Pike County and looked at these burial mounds, and they have found that these were the Hopewellian Indians. It was a ceremonial, a ceremonial mortuary center for regional Hopewellian population during the early portions of the Middle Woodland period, which is around the time of, of the Savior's coming, 50 BC to 100 AD, across there. And there's no problem with any of this. The problem comes when we misunderstand Zelf's story and apply it to saying Joseph didn't know what he was talking about. This is a different group of Indians. Or we take the story and we say, um, it now tells us about Book of Mormon geography. This is where Zarahemla was, or this is where Hill Cumorah was, or this is where the Great Last Battle was. That's the information that is wrong. If we want to learn more about the Book of Mormon, we have to look at the text. What does the text tell us? Well, first of all, in Mosiah, we learn that it only took eight days plus 12 days for a group of um, families with women and children and animals to travel from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla. A matter of a few weeks. The proportion is very small. We don't have a large geographical space here when we're talking about Book of Mormon geography in, um, for most of the book. And then in Alma, we learn that um, the population is growing so much and they're learning how to build boats and they've got this um, waterways right there that groups with Hagoth leave and they come and go. And Hagoth is just the one that's mentioned. There were others that go and they say they never heard of them more. We don't know where all these descendants went. And these descendants, these people that are now living in the um, Nephite area are a combination of the Jaredites and the Mulekites and those descendants of Lehi that have um, joined that culture. So we have a beautiful international, if you would use that word, um, group of people that are living there and then leaving to go elsewhere. And so by claiming that um, the Book of Mormon people were up in Illinois is not what the text says. But the text does say, no, we were spreading everywhere, just like the Jaredites did for 2,000 years before us. And then in the book of Helaman, 
um, we learn that between this distance of, of the um, Book of Mormon to get from uh, one location to the other, to get to the um, east to the West Sea, we have, it's just a, a journey day for a Nephite. And does that mean they're sprinting? Does that mean, you know, there's a lot of ramifications to that. And I don't want to get into geography other than saying, when Joseph is writing the Book of Mormon, there was very little known about the American continents. Mesoamerica, Latin America, or North America's archaeology. Very, very little was known. But the Book of Mormon claimed several things about itself. And this research was done by John Clark, and we have augmented it and augmented it at Book of Mormon Central, and you'll find updates there. But this um, is an example of the things, how little uh, we as an American people knew in 1842 about the archaeology, uh, the remnants of, of, of this continent and Latin America and Mesoamerica. But the book says it had all these things, steel and metal and wheat and barley and horses, et cetera, et cetera. And all, everything in red was thought to be incorrect. But over time, as continued research has moved on, we are learning more and more and more. And now, in 2019, this was augmented with a hundred more things the Book of Mormon says about itself, and we have so much more evidence that the Book of Mormon does belong in this ancient world, that it does fit in, and we will continue to find more and more things. So don't let Zelf's Bones teach you anything about geography in the Book of Mormon. It's not worth contention. Our Savior taught the Nephites when he came, I do not want a people of contention. And in order for us to prepare to redeem Zion, we have to be unified in following our prophet, unified in following our God. But he is going to come. And that day when we can redeem Zion, I hope will be in your future or our grandchildren's future. But whenever it happens, we can do our part to prepare for it. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.